Hello and welcome to another edition of Kansas City Experience. I'm Emily Woodring. KCX is a monthly program that pulls together a selection of segments from KCBT, Flatland, and 90.9 The Bridge that you might have missed. Coming up this month on KCX, we do a blind taste test to settle the age-old question, is beer better from a bottle or from a can? This one is just like a little bit better and I can't really put my finger on why. I just like it a little more. Jerry Cox had a curious KC question about what happened to Miller's Pool Hall. We dug into the archives to find out. We look at how Kansas City's atheists and agnostics connect with like-minded folks in the community. Our main thing is Sunday gatherings. So we have educational speakers and local musicians come in every week where people can just come in and enjoy a community without religion. Artist Vanessa Lacey gives us a glimpse of her creative process and shares her perspectives on the Kansas City arts community. Being an artist is a labor of love and it's not like you're going to make a million dollars most of the time being an artist. So the real value I found in being a part of the Kansas City arts community is its people. We meet Ryan and Lau Grobler and find out what inspired them to bring the taste of African sweet chili sauce to the metro. One day the Indian man offered him some, some sort of sauce, similar to what Ryan's manufacturing. And he said, take this home to your family and try it out. So, he, so my grandfather took it home to the family and they all loved it. And from our 90.9 bridge sessions, we share a performance from the songwriting duo, The Secret Sisters, who will be performing April 9th at Knuckleheads. Flee as a bird to your mountain Thou art weary of sin We kick things off this month with a sneak peek of the latest Ken Burns documentary, The Gene, which details the history, breakthroughs, and ethical dilemmas of genetic research. Jace got his first dose of the experimental treatment called Nusinersen through an infusion into his spinal fluid when he was just 18 days old. We were on a journey, it was kind of like miracle or bust, you know? We're gonna have a miracle or we're just going to lose him. Our hope was that maybe our baby would be able to at least sit or eat normal food or maybe he would walk even. January 24th. As time goes on and Jace begins to do things that Ariel didn't, there's this new hope like, hey, we're, it looks like we're going to get to raise him. I love how you walk with your hands up. We were at some friend's house for the evening, and I set Jace down on the floor. Daddy's there. And Jace just took a couple steps, and it was like, oh my goodness, he's doing it. Like, that's more than he's ever done before. Mm. Oh, look, got a child. Are you ready to go? Jace was just going back and forth between us, and we kept backing up, and he would go further. Come to daddy. You're doing so good. Whoa. That was amazing. Yay. Everyone that was there was standing around cheering, and it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then on our way home, it was just quiet, and we were all just kind of like, oh, like, did that really, this really happened? Chase recently celebrated his third birthday, unaware that he is a medical pioneer who represents the promise of a genomic revolution decades in the making. I'm going to get you. He and two dozen other pre-symptomatic children in the trial are all doing well. They need spinal infusions of the drug every few months. Yeah, 
but without them, they would almost certainly no longer be alive. I bet you can't catch me. There's just times in this journey where the full seriousness of it hits us and we're like, we're looking at something and we're holding a person who, like Earth has never seen anything like this before. This has not been possible. This is amazing. And yet, it's also really normal. I'm a dreamer. I mean, he's just my little son, so I'm just taking these moments for what they are and loving, loving him, loving life, loving the season of life that we're in. I think each moment where there has been a dramatic success doesn't just enliven the people who are working on that disease. It has ripples across the field. It's one more reason to believe uh, that those decades of really hard slogging are finally beginning to yield up some really remarkable events. And that makes everybody interested in working harder and probably recruits new people into the field who maybe were holding back uh, for fear that this wasn't ready yet. It seems to be ready now. Hi, I'm Cassie, and today on Tapless, we're gonna see if I can taste the difference between beer in a can versus beer in a bottle. To do this, we're gonna try three different Boulevard beers that are both distributed in cans and bottles. All right, I'm gonna go hide now so the producers can pour the beers and then I can blind taste test them. Is a bottle better? That's my hypothesis. A bottle is better. I don't, but is it? Tastes like the Boulevard wheat we all know and love. Let's see if this one is any different. Hmm. This one tastes like it's a little bit livelier, if that makes sense. This one is just like a little bit better and I can't really put my finger on why. I just like it a little more. Uh, so I'll just guess this is the bottle, this is the can. Now we've got Boulevard Pale Ale. Hmm. This one is a little hazier, again. I can see the continuous flow of bubbles from the bottom. This one probably has it too, but I just can't tell. I think this one I get a little more hops and this one I get a little more like yeasty notes. This is fun. <laughs> Yum. Pale ale is delicious. Okay, all right. Okay, so it's kind of the same as the last beer. It's like this one isn't quite as lively and effervescent as this one. I want to say that this one is the can. Yay! Hey, man, cans get a bad rap, but like so far, so good cans. We need to find out why. Tech server. I'm back. Let's take a look, see? There's like maybe a tiny, tiny, tiny bit hazier on this one, but it's not as obvious. Gets fresh in. Mm. Ooh, this one is way harder to tell. Um, I don't really detect much difference in aroma. So let's taste it. Maybe this one tastes like a little bit more effervescent than this one, but it's very hard to tell the difference between these two actually. So I'm just gonna guess that this one is the can and this one is the bottle. <laughs> I'm presupposing that maybe cans just 
trap that CO2 in a little better than bottles, and that's why the cans taste like just a little bit more lively and a little bit more bubbly than the bottles are. I mean, if anyone has ever been like, this one, t you can taste the can. I haven't found that to be true at all. In this case, I think the can was the better tasting beer in all three tests, so go cans. They're lighter, they're easier to transport. Mm, you can taste the difference. What's your preferred drinking vessel? Bottles, cans, draft, stein, leather pouch? Comment below. Starting on Tuesday, March 3rd, Flatland is hosting a beer bracket challenge, but it ain't March Madness. It's gonna be called Hops Hysteria. We're doing this to find out Kansas City's favorite beer. I am Nikki Actipis, and I'm the board president of Kansas City Oasis. So we do a lot of social justice work around the city, a lot of volunteering, and our main thing is Sunday gatherings. So we have educational speakers and local musicians come in every week where people can just come in and enjoy a community without religion. People are more important than beliefs. We don't have a structure of, hey, you have to do this. We value those connections with other humans more than we value the organization or what the organization means. So it's important to have that space without religion and make it secular because there are a lot of people coming out of religion or who have never been religious, such as myself, that haven't experienced community or still need community. And they want to just be with other people because I grew up atheist. And so I've been challenged with this question a lot throughout my life is, do you have morals? Where do your morals come from? To me, my guiding principles are, I see what's here and now, and I respect other people, and I want other people to grow and flourish. And that's the same as somebody who, who is religious. It can be freeing, and it can be super scary to know that there's no destiny in your life or somebody's not making those choices for you and helps people grow in a more positive direction. So our community moments are members of the community that want to present on a life moment or just a topic of their interest. So they can be silly, they can be serious, just something that interests a community member 
that they want to share with the rest of us. You get to know a little bit more about somebody that you see every week. So it turns an acquaintance into a friend. Last week, this past Sunday, I was at an all-time low, and I reached out to you guys, and you guys made all the difference in the world to me. So I thank you guys so much. We're such a great community, and I like to help people, and I know you all do too. And if you don't let people know how they can help you, they don't get to have that, that joy. We all need each other. And believe me, we're, we're there for each other. <laughs> Thank you. There's a little bit for everybody. And even religious folks, I tell them, hey, come check us out. We're not gonna bite. I'm Vanessa Lacey, and I'm a gallery owner and painter in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm at my highest purpose in life when I'm spreading paint across the surface and I'm not worried about anything else. Being an artist is a labor of love, and it's not like you're gonna make a million dollars most of the time being an artist, so the real value I found in being a part of the Kansas City arts community is its people. The best part about painting is when you're in a flow state and there is nothing else. There is only you and you're making marks. And every single mark reassures you that you're here, that you're in the moment, that you're doing only this, and you're not thinking about anything else. Being a painter for as many years as I have, a lot of it, it's almost like playing a piano. You don't have to think about which notes. There's a lot of muscle memory. And so instead of having to really consciously think about um, value decisions or um, color decisions or drawing, I can really just let my brain kind of go on autopilot and make a lot of those decisions for me. And I can really just enjoy the process. Really get it in there. So when I look at my picture and I see these black streaks, I'm gonna try and draw those with this really dark purple. Now we've got this blue. There's always this no. gnawing thing within me and the only thing that really feeds it is for me to get into that flow state and be producing a painting. When viewers look at my work and they see you know, they're the landmarks from their day-to-day -day life, but instead of seeing them from their car on their commute, they see them in this serene, um, moody cityscape that's sort of more atmospheric and expansive. And I think that's why a lot of my cityscapes don't have people in them most of the time, because it's really more about things being slow and just taking in how the light is falling on the buildings and the landmarks and the wet streets than it is about you know, the busyness or the things that happen around them and in them during the day, it's more about um, when everybody goes home and, and everything is still and quiet in the city. That's usually the times that I like to paint. So the gallery came about about a year after I had resigned from teaching. Some of the things that we have going on in the gallery are receptions or networking events. Uh, last month we had Kansas City Women in the Arts networking event. Every month they meet in a different arts organization and there's an artist talk and the female artists get to network and talk and have a few drinks together. I got to connect with some other women artists in the community and they got to hear what I'm all about at the gallery and how I run things. It was wonderful. Kansas City, I just, there's so many wonderful people in Kansas City, it's really hard to sum it up in one little talking point, how blessed I feel to have landed here in Kansas City and not try to go anywhere else. 
I feel totally blessed and I feel like all those really difficult times where I was struggling and I'm at questioning why am I doing this, why am I doing this, I feel like the attention that the gallery is getting is, is the payoff. It's that I've stuck it out, I've been in this city making art for over 10 years and it's finally, the city is paying me back for all the times I've, I've captured its beauty, I think. It's nice to see a new type of source on the market that is uh, unique and it's from a unique part of the world. Not a lot of people have had an African chili sauce. So of course back at home we used to, you know, mum used to show us how to prepare this sauce. We used African bird's eye chilies. But one day when I was visiting my mum, I found this recipe in her recipe book and I said, oh, I'd love to try that. So I, I wrote down, took down the recipe and I went back home. We were living in South Africa then and I began to make this chili. I've always loved spicy things, curries, and I just thought this would be something nice to make. My grandmother's husband, he had an Indian friend in Rhodesia and he used to go in from the farm on a, a cart pulled by oxen and he would go once a month and pick up his supplies. One day the Indian man offered him some, some sort of sauce similar to what Ryan's manufacturing. And he said, take this home to your family and try it out. So, he, so my grandfather took it home to the family and they all loved it. So today we're just, uh, we're here in a, in a local kitchen, in our kitchen actually. Um, the facility that we have uh, been using in, in Kansas City to manufacture this, we've actually outgrown. And uh, we're moving into a new uh, co-packer here in Kansas City, um, small batch co-packer that will allow us to produce more of the sauce as it has become very, very popular uh, in the local markets as well as uh, some around the country now. We make all the preserves, uh, we cut fresh uh, tomatoes, some fresh onions. If you're cooking with chilies or making a sauce or whatever, you should always sweeten it with a little bit of, of sugar or some sweetener so because it enhances the chili flavor it's not so raw if you know what i mean or, or it just enhances the chili further it's uh, organic it's uh, gluten free it's gluten free it's vegan when people taste it it's always nice to see the reaction on their face because it is yes. something that's that that i think most people haven't really tasted a sauce like this before
but they don't know I pay the cost. And they don't know what I've lost. Davy White, where is he tonight? He's sleeping with her in a Tennessee town and he's fine. I think I lost my mind and my wasted time. I'm dreaming. Tennessee town and he's fine.